All right, so we're on. We've been talking forever. We've been yeah. going, what, two days now of training. You brought me to the range, showed me a lot, showed me more than I knew before, trust me. And, and going over that and understanding like how you train and how you coach, it's a testament to who you are. We, we rolled again today, this morning. Yeah. We got some pad work in. So that this is, awesome. I wanted to do this because like we said, we talked about it's like, we want to break the ice, you know, and really get to know each other before we do this type of interview. But I want people to understand, especially my audience right now from the, the MMA world, the fighting world, what you've done and how you've done it and how great, like, you know, your journey has became, has became like people's beacon of hope in a sense, you know, decorated Navy SEAL, um, you know, have done a lot and also went through a lot. But let's go through from the beginning. Right. Yep. Eddie Gallagher. Who is Eddie Gallagher and how it all got started? <laughs> <laughs> Done. Well, hey, first off, man, I appreciate you guys coming down in the past two days have been awesome. You know, did, going to the range and then coming here, rolling and doing some pad work mm -hmm. like the knowledge transfer. That's what it's all about. I mean, it's been phenomenal. So I appreciate far, it, so man. Appreciate yeah. It, brother. Um, yeah. So pretty much I was born uh, in Jersey. Uh, my dad was in the army. I was born a military brat, uh, so I moved around every two years mm -hmm. uh, growing up. Grew up mainly in Asia most of my life, so China, yeah. Korea, Japan. I'd bounce back and forth, uh, you know, come back to the States for two years and go to Asia for two years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had a pretty, like, wide uh, knowledge base of what the world was, you know, mm -hmm. is when I was little. Um, yeah. And I definitely appreciated what the United States was, you know what I mean? I was always happy to come back to the United States every each and every time. That's funny because, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I travel a lot doing the seminars, right? Mm -hmm. And I always am like, man, we have it so good over here. Like people yeah. don't realize that until they go into these third world countries or something along the lines of that. And they're like, yeah, they have no freedom whatsoever. Exactly. So, yeah, my bad, keep going. No, it's all good. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's the truth. I mean, even when, as a little kid, I, I understood that. Like yeah. coming back here and like we, America is in America for a reason. We yeah. have everything we need here, and we have, the big thing we have is absolute freedom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so yeah, I grew up uh, a military brat until uh, my dad got out when I was a uh, freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up moving to Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, mm -hmm. and I finished out my high school career there. And from there, I went straight into the Navy. Um, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't like on the the first choice that yeah. I wanted to do growing up. I didn't I, I didn't grow up like wanting to be in the military. I okay. just grew up around the military, so that's all I knew. Gotcha. Um, and you know, I was a troublemaker uh, mm -hmm. in high school. My grades weren't that great. Mm -hmm. uh, really had no direction. So when I got out, um, I knew I was going down a bad bad road. I mean, I had they're good friends, loyal friends, but they're mm -hmm. the type of dudes. That, you know, it was uh, either going to end up in prison mm -hmm. or doing something on the streets. So yeah. I decided uh, right then and there, I was like, all right, I'm gonna join the military mm -hmm. and get out of here and go make something of myself. Um, I knew when I joined that I wanted to be a SEAL. Um, I grew up, you know, obviously watching all the movies and yeah. the big one, which Navy SEALs mm -hmm. uh, is, that was like pretty much, had a big impression on me. Of course. Um, that and Top Gun. So, yeah. <clears throat> and I, all my, and the other thing to add is like all my uncles, and my dad, they're all military. Mm -hmm. uh, they're either naval aviators or my dad was in the army. Mm -hmm. So when I went, I went into the recruiter's office and was like, yeah, I want to be a SEAL, yeah. sign me up. And of course I was like a recruiter's wet dream. He was like, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Super went, athletic still at that point. You were playing um, soccer, right? Yeah, I grew up playing soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents definitely forced athletics on me yeah. every year growing up. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I dabbled in every sport, but soccer mm -hmm. was my main one. I played basketball, tried gave baseball mm -hmm. uh, about a year, um, but soccer was like usually the main mm -hmm. the main sport I was playing. So I had some yeah some athleticism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously <clears throat> by the end of high school, I wasn't playing anything. I was more out there partying, chasing girls. Uh, so um, when I decided to join the Navy, that's I sort of like a, a flip or a switch was flipped in my brain. I was like, okay, I need to get in shape. Mm -hmm. I need to start training to be a warrior. Yeah. Uh, that's And that's pretty much what I wanted to be, right? I was like, I want to be a warrior. I want to be like all these dudes I saw on the, the big screen. Mm -hmm. um, but little did I know what that had, what that entailed. Yeah. It was just a, a thought. So ended up joining the, uh, the Navy, went to boot camp, and then uh, I didn't have a contract to go right to BUDS to mm -hmm. be a SEAL. Uh, the recruiter duped me on that one. So 
it actually worked out to my benefit. Um, I chose to go with the Marines. Oh, um, really? So, yeah, I was a medic. I went to Corps School, which is a medic in the Navy, mm-hmm. and the Marines do not have their own medics, so they rely on the Navy to provide them. Um, okay. So that was an option. I raised my hand. I was like, yeah, I want to go with the Marines. Um, so I spent my first four years in the military with uh, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, mm. um, which provided so much opportunity. Um, you know, the whole time I wanted to be a SEAL still, so I was training. I was obsessed. Uh, How old were you at this point? Um, I was 19, 19 and Oh, 20. so you're still super young. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was, you know, like I said, that switch was flipped, so I, I became obsessed. So all I did was just train mm. twice a day, every mm. day, uh, swim, run, do all the calisthenics. Uh, but then in between that, I signed up for as many schools that I thought would benefit me to get me prepared for BUD. So I went to assault climbers course, uh, marine combat water uh, instructor. Um, I became, that's a real tough course. Mm-hmm. I ended up making it through that. And then I was definitely privileged enough to go to Marine Corps Sniper School. Mm-hmm. Um, so I you know, got through that. And then during that whole time, 9-11 had kicked off, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, so we deployed... Uh, my first deployment was pre-9-11, um, not much going on there. We did some stuff in uh, Kosovo, uh, but that really wasn't any action or anything. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. And then 9-11 kicked off, and we ended up deploying uh, about a year after that, and that's when the invasion was happening yeah. uh, in Iraq, and everything was sort of brand new as far as war. So at the moment, so you went in as a Marine in the I was first in the deployment. Navy. In the Navy still? Yeah, but okay. attached to the Marines. Attached to the Marines, okay. Mm-hmm. All right, excuse me for my unknowledge. That's all right, yeah. I yeah. mean, even people in the military have yeah. a hard time understanding. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So I know that there may be some that are listening, like, and and I've heard before, it's like, you can't really get ready for buds, but, like, what are the main things that you would look at? Like, because you said you, you did your prerequisites before yeah. you got in there. What are some things that somebody, not in maybe not in the military, that can do? to prepare for that? So, yeah, I mean, the big thing what I tell people is you, you're never going to be fully prepared for BUDS. Yeah. BUDS is a, more of a mental game than for sure. anything, right? Yeah. But what you can do to prep yourself for that is be as in the best physical shape as possible mm-hmm. showing up there. Um, by doing that, by be- becoming obsessed and by making sure you're mentally or physically prepared to go and you're putting in the time each day and Mm -hmm. staying consistent, Mm -hmm. you are going to build up mental resiliency by doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that will also help when you get to buds. But, you know, I tell guys now that they get asked questions, you know, I'm like, hey, when you get there, just know, like, you're going to show up in the best shape possible, but you are going to, it's a grind. They're going to beat you down to hamburger meat and then they're going to keep on doing it. Um, And it's just, you need to have that resiliency and that mental toughness to get mm-hmm. up each day and go through it again. Um, you know, the, when I was going to Buzz, I asked some SEAL, I remember I was like, hey, what's it like? And yeah. he's like, it's like getting in a bar fight every day and getting your ass kicked and then waking up and going to do it again. Do it again. Um, yeah. And that's all it is. It's a yeah. grind. Uh, but just preparing physically will also get you prepared mentally as well mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and staying consistent. Gotcha. So now 9-11 hits. What happens then? Uh, so yeah, one eight. We were on a deployment. Uh, they ended up, we ended up going into Mosul, Iraq, um, mm-hmm. but that was for a very short stint. Mm-hmm. I came back from that deployment and got my orders to buds uh, right off the bat. So came back from there, um, got my orders, drove from North Carolina all the way out to San Diego, mm-hmm. and checked into buds and uh, was in class. Started off in class two five one. And I ended up getting rolled in second phase for pool comp, which is uh, another test gate during second phase diving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ended up finishing in class 252 and graduating. Gotcha. Yeah. How physically, eh, how mentally draining was it just to go through that situation? It's, it depends, man. Like I, the road to get there for me was really tough. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kept on getting told no, no, no every time I screened to go to Buds, um, yeah. just because they wanted to keep their numbers at, with the Marines, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so by the time I was actually allowed to go, I was beyond happy to be there. I yeah. mean, I just I was in a 
positive attitude the whole time, even when we were getting beaten down. I was just grateful that I had the chance to be there. Um, it is definitely stressful. Um, a lot of the things are mentally, there's not, you don't have to be a brainiac to go. Mm -hmm. um, but the constant pressure that's put on you there to perform, to especially to perform, you want to be at the top uh, and then pass all those test gates. Mm -hmm. It's nonstop. So it's a constant grind. So yeah, it is uh, mentally taxing. But the good thing is you have ample enough time to take care of yourself. So you have the weekends off. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if you're not taking the time during the weekends to like lick your wounds and recover, um, then yeah, it's going to be a lot tougher that next week. And some mm -hmm. guys end up doing that. They'll go out to the bars, party, do whatever. And then the next week starts and they're weaker than they were the week before. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's, it is tough, but you can also take advantage of the free time mm -hmm. to make sure you're prepared for that next week. Gotcha. Okay. So get through buds. Now you're fully a Navy SEAL. Yep. Well, obviously there's other sections yeah. I have to go through, right? So yeah, you go, you get down with buds, um, and then you check into SQT, SEAL mm -hmm. qualification training. Mm -hmm. So you don't have your trident just yet. Um, you go through another, I think it's, it was like six or seven months oh, of, uh, wow. it, it's like advanced training. I wouldn't even call it advanced training. It's just training to get you prepared to check into a team. Okay. So you, you aren't completely lost when you get to a team. Mm -hmm. So you go through every, uh, cell, like, you go through land warfare, assaults, diving, all that all over again. Well, mm -hmm. not for the first time, really. Um, and so when you get to a team, you're not just, you know, the team knows what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's on the same sheet of music okay. as far as training. Okay. But you earn your trident at the end of that, at the end of SQT. And then I was, since I was a medic, I was uh, voluntold pretty much to go to 18 Delta, which is Special Operations Medical School. Um, mm -hmm. And that was another eight months. Um, and that actually was probably one of the toughest courses I've ever been to. Yeah. Um, yeah, you are drinking through a fire hose. You're pretty much learning everything a med student learns in that eight months, and yeah. you're expected to pass. Yeah, yeah super all accelerated. these written tests. Um, so that, was, that actually was probably the toughest part for me mm -hmm. because, like I said, I wasn't a good student in high school. I didn't yeah. have the discipline. Yeah. So there it forced me to be disciplined, it forced mm -hmm. me to be staying up late, studying, yeah. um, you know, making sure I was passing the test. It's amazing that like when you get to a point where you actually want to learn a, cer a certain subject, yeah. how well you can stay on task and focus on it as opposed to just going to school when things you really don't want to learn. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have a purpose. There's so such a purpose yeah. there. So like even when you're learning here, like you're you're in in the moment, you know? There's yep. nothing else going on. The focus is pinpoint accurate. And I think a lot of people kind of miss that or misinterpret I don't want to be like a beacon for all education in school, but if you take your education, you don't let you know school get in the way of your education. And you look at school, and I tell my kids all this all the time, it's not what you actually are learning because some of the stuff you're not going to use. But if you take it as a means to understand how to learn or recover knowledge and interpret that knowledge in the right way yeah. and it also teaches you work ethic and and staying on point organization right things like that if you look at it like that that's your true education yeah you know what i mean it is and you're getting educated every day right especially being in the position that you're in like you have to look almost outside the box in a sense and how you're actually learning what's this learning process about is it about getting better is it about you know understanding yourself so these come into play because the best thing that you can have, in my opinion, is is having to understand who you are, right? That is key. And I'll yeah. tell you, like, what's funny, you, you just said that I just, you getting out of the military, mm -hmm. you pretty much have to restart that all over again. Mm -hmm. Like, who, because you're no, you're no longer a SEAL. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, I'm out. And after doing that for 20 years, you're like, well, who, who am I? Yeah. Like, I, who am I without that? Mm -hmm. And so you have to sort of re reinvent yourself mm -hmm. and find out who you are, which I spent the last three years doing. Yeah. Um, just trying to figure out, okay, what drives me? What what certain things, you know, do I like, do I not like? Um, mm -hmm. And it's been, like you said, every day, it's an education every day, mm -hmm. um, just yeah. trying to learn. And I think once you learn about yourself and figure yourself out, everything else sort of falls into place. For sure, yeah. yeah. So with that, now, you're going through the system, right? You're understanding the process. Yep. What happens after? Because there's a there's a time where now you're. I mean, how many deployments have you been on? 
Uh, nine. Nine. Eight combat, one nine. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Within that time frame, when you're starting to learn this, what's going through your mind? What's going through your brain? Like, what are you trying to accomplish at that point? You mean during that time? Yeah. Oh, well, during that time, like when you check into a team, mm -hmm. you are surrounded by giants. Mm -hmm. Like these dudes are warriors. You're constantly, at least for me, I was constantly trying to just prove that I belong there with them, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, it's a nonstop train. Um, and that's, you're going 150 miles, you know, whatever, 200 miles an hour, constantly, um, constantly trying to better yourself, always signing up for schools. Um, you're trying to make yourself an asset mm -hmm. to the team mm -hmm. and almost you, you want to be needed. Like you can't go on this op without me. You know what I mean? You need to bring me along. I, I belong here. Um, and that's the attitude that I had that all my brothers had going th you know, going through uh, our career and that never ends. So like you can do, you know, four or five combat deployments that means nothing in the SEAL teams. I mean, it's like, great, you know, you're doing your job, but you're also advancing each and every time. Um, you're learning more about combat, because combat doesn't stay the same. The, each combat deployment I went on was completely different from the last. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly figuring out warfare, how to be, how to be better, um, and you're pretty much learning how to destroy the enemy mm -hmm. uh, the best way possible and mitigating as much risk to you and your teammates as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, the training never stops. Um, you know, you're bettering yourself in every aspect possible. So, you know, whether it's, you know, learning a new skill, um, going to a new school, or then, you know, when you're off time doing MMA, yeah. you know, just trying to keep yourself sharp cool. on every level. I like that. You're just increasing your value each and yeah. every year. It, it, that makes sense. And, and everybody should understand that. And actually, look to thrive to be better every year and every every day on us honestly yeah so okay so now first let's talk about the first appointment like how that feel like bef after the the first one the real one i guess you would say so i'll i'll start at like the when i my first appointment at the seal teams yep um it was uh it was awesome i can't say i won't say the real one that doesn't sound right the the, the one in the seal teams yeah let's put my it first like appointment, yeah. Each, yeah i mean each appointment is real but yeah like, for yeah, sure 100%. Uh, now that i was with uh, a bunch of other seals operators um it, it was awesome it was everything yeah. you know that i had expected you know it was a uh somewhat pretty busy deployment we were doing a lot of it was all da focused uh, direct action so we we're mm -hmm. going out hitting houses every night um and just really as a new guy you're just drinking from a fire hose you're trying to you know intake as much knowledge from the older guys from your yeah. chief mm -hmm. um and you're getting judged every day like as a new guy they're looking at you like all right is this guy doing his job mm -hmm. is he trying to be better um, gotcha. but uh i was around a lot of good mentors i was i was blessed i had a lot of good uh older guys who mm -hmm. looked out for us and you know trained us up yeah um but it was uh it was good it was and like i said it, we were lucky to go on that uh combat deployment and have that mm -hmm. experience and that sort of just followed through onto my next deployment. We went, mm -hmm. went to Afghanistan, gotcha. um, and that was another pretty awesome, busy deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was now we weren't a new guy anymore. You're stepping up. You know, you're only a two pump chump, what they call them. But at the same time, you are starting to get put into leadership roles right away. Yeah. Um, so now you're in charge of a fire team, maybe, or okay. you might be in charge of one or two guys. Mm -hmm. um, and that. Like I said, each each deployment comes with a new experience, and then you're just building off of that, um, all that knowledge. And so, by the time <clears throat> you come around to your third or fourth combat deployment, that's when you start realizing, like, oh, I have all this knowledge that maybe these guys below me don't, and then you start dumping that onto them, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and you're really just trying to make them better mm -hmm. as well. We talked a bit about like experience and your ability to stay calm under pressure, right? And you were telling me a story about when guys were getting shot at and like things were going crazy, like how you had to be the one to keep them all level. How's that experience and how, how do you go about actually keeping them calm in the face of absolute adversity? Well, we got, I mean, there's a saying in the teams, you know, calm breeds calm, right? So you actually, I actually learned this through training. Um, during CQC training, actually, when we're, you know, you're taking down structures, um, so when you stack up against 
the door ready to go in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have one guy in the train that's amped up and he's like, here we go, here we go, and you know, bolts in the room, well that's sending a chain down the rest of the train and now everybody else is amped up and they're running in there, yeah. right? And what, if you react that way and you, you know, enter a room that way, you are going to drop something. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely focused on like, hey, remain calm, uh, you know, everything you do should be methodical. Um, there is times to amp it up, but you should remain calm. Try to remain calm throughout, even, mm -hmm. you know, during firefights or whatever, you know, keep your head on a swivel, but have maintain uh, your cognitive ability to actually give orders, um, give direction, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't do that if you are amping yourself up and letting the situation, you don't let the situation dictate how you act. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, but that comes with experience, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I could say like, you know, the first firefight I was in, I was definitely like, oh shit, like, you know, yeah. we talked about it, these are real bullets coming. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, everybody's scared, they don't want to yeah. get hit. But the more experience you have, um, you know, the, the more you get used to it and the, the calmer you are around it and you can start actually taking a step back and looking at the big picture and like, okay, this is what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so by my eighth combat deployment, I could say I was, you know, I was at that level to where, you know, if we were getting shot at or put in a chaotic or stressful situation, mm -hmm. I could take a step back and sort of breathe and be like, all right, this is what needs to happen next. Where some of the newer guys weren't like, you know, this was their first time. So their eye, you know, their eyes are saucers, like, yeah. what the hell are we doing out here? But that's, yeah. that's the beauty of the SEAL teams too, though. I mean, you have, when you have good leaders that who have been there, they're going to pass that off to the younger guys and try mm -hmm. to get them up to speed. Gotcha. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the situation that caused the book and, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. your, your uh, vacation, in a sense, yeah. for, for a couple <laughs> My nine paid months. paid vacation. Nine and a half. Nine and a half, right? Yeah. Nine and a half. Can you just go into whatever detail you want to go into, like, whatever you feel comfortable, but can you explain, like, what all happened in that situation? Yeah. Uh, so, it, it was my last deployment, mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, put in a leadership role. I was mm -hmm. platoon chief, uh, which means I'm in charge of the tactical picture, right? Um, so I'm pretty much in charge of, uh, you know, what tactics we're going to implement on, on whatever target or situation that's presented in front of us. Um, so we ended up, I had a, I had a platoon that was very green. Um, yeah. A lot of new guys, um, a lot of guys without any combat experience, mm -hmm. which was fine. Um, but they all wanted, they all wanted the combat experience, just like every SEAL does. They're like, hey, I, we want to go to war. Mm -hmm. um, and we got exactly what we asked for, so we got sent to Mosul, Iraq, um, which at the time, ISIS, that was an ISIS stronghold. Mm -hmm. And no one had um, attempted to breach into Mosul at that point, um, except the team before us started a little bit. They cleared the eastern side, I believe, which was uh, more desert and open. Um, mm -hmm. By the time we got there, that's when we were going into the city, and Mosul's a massive city. Yeah. Um, so we got paired up with a uh, Iraqi partner force, um, ERD, the Emergency Response Division, and so I mean, pretty much as soon as we landed in the country, we hit the ground running. Um, we were there to advise, assist in the company. So we weren't the front line, mm -hmm. but we were pretty much right behind, supposedly trying to advise these Iraqis on what to do. Did yeah. they listen? Not really. I mean, yeah. the reality is they were there. We were there so they could use our bombs and mm. weapons to destroy ISIS, which is fine. Uh, we, we ended up clearing through Mosul uh, and actually um, accomplished the mission within six months. Um, but during that time, there was some of the younger guys in my platoon. And they, I want to say younger. They weren't new guys. They were on their third platoon. Mm -hmm. But they just didn't have any combat experience. Um, they didn't like my leadership or they didn't, they, we had a personal conflict. So, sure. um, yeah. and it sort of grew throughout the deployment. Um, I had no, I had no idea how bad it had become. Um, they sort of created this toxic environment within the platoon and sort of, we call it the sewing circle, uh, which actually they named themselves that, but they would try and bring other people from the platoon into the little circle to like, oh, like clicks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like the mean, we call them the mean girls yeah. from the movie. Right. Um, so this, this was happening during deployment and by the end of deployment, it had sort of come to a halt or an, um, when I found out, I found out what they were doing. Yeah. And so I called a meeting and was like, 
what's going on? Like, let's get this out in the open. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what, what are the issues here? And basically the issues that were thrown at me was, you know, we don't agree with this mission. You're working us too hard. We don't want to go out every day. Um, which I never thought I'd hear come from my uh, seal's mouth. Um, so it, me being in that leadership position, I had a very hard time dealing with it because um, I've never dealt with that before. What what was so hard though? Like I, I don't want to sound like that, but what I want to like, don't you know what you're getting into? Is that that kind of doesn't? Because I go through the same thing from a leadership standpoint. Yeah. With other with people that I have to lead, and I feel you. Like if you're not on, some people are just mediocre at heart. Yeah. And. If that's the case, then they are not supposed to be a part of the situation. Yep. And that's so those are the talks I had. I mean, I would literally sit them down and be like, do you understand yeah. what a golden opportunity this deployment is? Like no one else is getting this type of action or experience right mm -hmm. now. Like mm -hmm. other platoons were filling sandbags for six months. And I was like, they would give their right not to be here in your position. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of stories. Uh, stress or like shame in the SEAL team so like these guys would not admit one in one second like oh I don't want to be here but mm -hmm. their actions that's what their actions said mm -hmm. um, so it was very hard because each time I have these talks we're like well no we, we want to go yeah but we don't want to go this hard we want to <laughs> you know have breaks um, and I you know and I was a uh, just a no bullshit leader I was like mm -hmm. we're not going to change what we're doing I was like you can either stay on board or leave I'm mm -hmm. like this is a volunteer program I'm like, you can leave any time. Oh, wow. Um, so they weren't even stuck there? No, they could have. I could have switched them out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they would tell me, like, no, we want to stay. And okay. so I gave them the benefit of the doubt. And I actually, you know, there are some leadership traits or some leadership lessons that I've taken away from it. You know, I was definitely not empathetic to some of their needs. You know, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, they, it was a very chaotic, stressful deployment. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of uh, carnage. I mean, thinking back now, from what we saw, you know, we're seeing women and kids get mowed down in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're climbing over dead bodies every other day, trying to get into positions. Um, you know, yeah. we lived next to a torture chamber um, that was right on our wall, so we'd go to sleep every night listening to ISIS prisoners get raped and tortured. Uh, yeah. So that all can definitely have an effect, For sure, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think if you're not used to I don't think anybody's used to it, but if you're not like, hey, this is war, this mm -hmm. is the job, it's not pretty, it's not black and white, um, then yeah, you probably have some, some questions about like, why am I doing this, mm -hmm. um, which is I think where those guys were at. And I'll say this, the leadership, um, the upper brass was coming to us once a month, um, giving us these speeches like, this isn't your fight, don't do anything out there that's gonna get you killed, don't feel you the, you the need to step up and like start you know taking it to the enemy. You were yeah. there to advise and assist. Or mm -hmm. I had a different thought. I'm like, I like we're the ones leaving the wire every day, going out there playing hopscotch with IEDs, dodging V bids, dodging bullets. I'm like, no, we mm -hmm. are taking the fight to the enemy. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, we've never been a defensive element. Like we're out here, we are going to crush the enemy as much as possible. Yeah. So there was those two different elements too, which I think came into effect with these younger guys mm -hmm. um, questioning while they were there. Um, either way, you know, everybody made it to the end of that deployment. Um, but these guys <clears throat> had already known that I had called them out. Um, by the end of the deployment, I was like, hey, you, you guys are acting like a bunch of cowards, um, mm -hmm. which is probably the worst thing you can say to a SEAL, yeah. but it was the truth. So when we got back from that deployment, they had decided to start a um, smear campaign internally, going around to different guys at teams, like just making up stuff about me, like, oh, this he's too aggressive, he's too dangerous, um, which I heard all those and I'm like, I'm, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But then they started really digging in, like, oh, he's a thief. He's, you know, really attacking my character. Mm -hmm. So again, they were, guys were coming up to me because I had a pretty good, uh, Decent reputation in the teams. I knew a lot of people. So obviously they were coming to me like, dude, your guys were like saying all this stuff about you. So I called them in for one last meeting. And I was like, dude, this has got to end, blah, blah, blah. We've had that meeting. They all agreed to like end it and go on with their careers, um, which it's not what they did. They yeah. then started going to the command, demanding. Um, so I had been put in for a silver star 
Um, I was picking up senior chief. I was given a pretty good position uh, to instruct over at a training detachment. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty much like, you need to take away all those things from him um, because he's dangerous and this <laughs> and that. And the command was like, well, that's not what his pit rep says. And he, I got the number one chief out of the, out of the team. They're like, this guy is killing it. Um, so they were like, you guys need to go decompress mm -hmm. and move on with your life. Mm -hmm. About three months later, they came back to the command and they were like, well, now we have uh, evidence that he, he killed a uh, ISIS prisoner, stabbed him to death. And so the command was like, all right, well, we're going to report this up because they have, and I don't blame the command for doing it. They're like, we're not going to sit on this. So they reported it to NCIS, um, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, which is like the, it's the investigative service for the Navy. They investigate the Navy and Marines. They're toy cops, really. Yeah. Um, once they got involved, then it, it went haywire. Um, you had this uh, agent, Agent Warpinski. He was looking to make a name for himself, um, and so he thought bagging a seal was going to get him promoted. Um, so you had this combination of ambition and incompetence all crashing down. And so <clears throat> as soon as I, I got put pretty much in an office and told I was being investigated um, and just to sit there and everything's going to work out. Yeah. You know, this is not a big deal. Uh, a couple months later, my house gets raided um, by about 25 um, NCIS agents and the FBI was there. Uh, my wife and I weren't home, just my two younger boys. They pulled them out in their underwear. Um, I put automatic weapons in their face, put on a whole show. I mean, they blocked off my whole street like I was a cartel member. And all of that is just a, a way to intimidate and it's a fear factor. It lets everybody else know around you like, hey, we're, they must have done something, yeah. right? And it yeah. worked because even the neighbors that we had we're like, well, they just don't do that to anybody. Um, yeah, yeah. So that happened. Um, that's when we decided to move to Florida. I was going to retire. I was like, okay. this. We're is still in Indiana? We were in San Diego, San California Diego. at this time. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, moved my wife and kids out here. Let me sort of make some notes. <clears throat> and uh, ended up going back to San Diego by myself to geobatch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Pretty much finished out my enlistment um, until I retired. Uh, they NCIS was staking me out the whole time. They knew I moved my family, and as soon as I went back, I went to a uh, TBI clinic, uh, mm. traumatic brain injury clinic, which is the norm before you get out. All SEALs go there to get fully checked out head to toe and get whatever help you need to get before you get out so you can function in the real world, in the yeah. civilian world. Uh, while I was there on September 11th, they came and arrested me, um, and no charges. They were just like, we have to take you to military prison. Uh, we're, we've been ordered by the Admiral to do so. Um, they had really nothing. I asked them, like, why? What am I doing? Am I being a threat to anybody? Like, I don't understand. They're mm -hmm. like, it doesn't matter. We're following orders. They threw me in military prison, and once I got thrown in there, there was no getting out. Mm -hmm. um, you, I was in pretrial confinement, um, so you're not technically a prisoner, but mm -hmm. you are. They yeah. tell you, like, oh, no, you're, you're in pretrial, but you're still you're called a prisoner. You're treated just like everybody else. Um, and pretty much you're just sitting there and wait for your trial date. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, and it, this is all a tactic they pull, right? So they put me in there to shut me up so I couldn't defend myself while they went out and just went on a smear campaign through the media, um, through everywhere else. They just started dumping all this stuff. Where you couldn't defend yourself at all? No, not mm -hmm. one bit. Um, that's the tactic they wanted to use to put me away for life without parole. That's what I was facing um, for killing an ISIS terrorist. And uh, what they didn't take into account was my wife. Um, she, as soon as they pulled all this you know, BS, my wife then took to social media um, and started her own little social media campaign, like, hey, here's what's really going on and getting the truth out there. And she started getting a following and really got people's attention. And then eventually she got uh, the attention of Fox News. Mm -hmm. She was invited on there on Fox and Friends, in which she was told that at the time, Donald Trump, uh, the President Donald Trump, watched that avidly every day. Mm -hmm. So she got on there and pretty much, I mean, did one hell of a job of like, what's going on is a mess and we need your help. Yeah. Um, and so eventually <clears throat> the president got involved in the way, best way that he does is he sent out a tweet and was like, 
let this dude out of prison so he can properly defend himself. Because while I was in prison, I was not allowed any of the rights that you would think you would have to medical. I wasn't allowed to see my lawyers. Um, you're just literally sitting there, um, not being able to defend yourself one bit. Yeah. So he said, let this guy out so he can properly defend himself before he goes to trial. He wasn't saying I was guilty or not guilty. Mm -hmm. He was just like, give this guy the rights he's earned. Fair trial. Right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, because of how divided the country is, once that happened, then I really became a target from the left, right? They were like, oh, this is one of Trump's boys. And that's when the media really took an onslaught on us and started putting out all sorts of stuff. So it was, uh, it was a, definitely an experience. Um, we drank through a fire hose just learning how the media manipulates everything. Um, mm -hmm. Just a whole slew of things that we had to like sift through. Um, but we remained, you know, defiant the whole time, strong. I mean, my family is beyond resilient, and yeah. we're a very tight-knit unit, so we stuck together, you know, and I had a lot of loyal friends come to my side. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we ended up, we go went to trial, mm -hmm. um, and that's a big misconception. I'm sure maybe some of the listeners probably think that I was not pardoned, mm -hmm. that that was put out there for so long. Um, I went to trial, I faced a jury of my peers, and I got found not guilty of all accounts except for uh, posing with a dead body, mm -hmm. um, which there was 12 other members of my platoon posing with the body as well. I was the only one that was charged. Um, but because the Navy had spent so much money trying to prosecute me, and then they ended up losing, they let their egos get in the way. And that one charge I had, they tried to, which would have been a slap on the wrist, anywhere else like oh you took a picture of that body all right mm -hmm. you know don't do that um but they decided to take my retirement um take everything it's like my whole 20 years never existed mm -hmm. so that was my punishment um but the punishment didn't go into effect for like two or three months uh, so i was then in purgatory after the trial sort of waiting around and at that point we decided not to take that either we were like we're gonna fight and get yeah, his absolutely. my retirement and everything um and that's when the president stepped in again for the second time and pretty much he called me and was like, this is bullshit. Um, what's going on? And I'm going to, you're going to retire with everything that you've earned over the 20 years. This is done. Mm -hmm. um, he actually put out a tweet about it as well. So I went to the command the next day after he had done that and they, I mean, it was unbelievable. They were like, well, now we're going to do this to you. And they were like, we're going to take your trident and publicly shame you. And I'm like, okay. You know, at that point, I was like, this is ridiculous. This is all in like a year span. Yeah, isn't it? This, is, this is all in like a three or four month span. Oh, my goodness. But yeah, from the time I went to prison, yeah. and this was still about a year, mm. um, the president then steps in. And this, this is where it gets funny. It's like it was no longer about me. Mm -hmm. It was the leadership of the Navy going against the president of the United States. And they were just going back and forth. And I was being used as a football, just being tossed back and forth. The president actually did care about what was happening to me, which is he knew more details about everything that was going on, all the corruption. I mean, one thing I forgot to bring up <clears throat> during the trial is the prosecutor got caught um, spying red-handed on all my lawyers. Mm. Um, he sent a beacon out to all my lawyers and to some of the media who were writing positive articles about me. Um, this beacon, if they clicked on it, he would get all the information that my lawyers had, everything, so they could manipulate the trial. Well, mm -hmm. he got caught red-handed doing that. If that was any other legal system, yeah. the case so, wasn't like, case this calls. is done, yeah. that prosecutor's going to prison. But because it's the military, all they did was remove that prosecutor and bring a new one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean... The president at the time, Trump, knew all, all this was going on. Mm -hmm. So he, he stood behind me each and every time. And so uh, yeah, once he was like, you will not be taking his trident, he put another tweet out. like get, He pretty much told Naval Special Warfare, he's like, get back to work. Mm -hmm. Like, leave this alone. Yeah. Just... And uh, you know, then I ended up able to get out. Uh, I got out in December of 2019 mm -hmm. um, and then ended up coming back or coming to Florida where I had originally moved my family. Yep, yep. Why Florida? You know, that's a God thing. Um, I came down here for a training trip, um, saw this area, which is, you know, Destin. Yep. Um, 
it's beautiful here. Yeah. And so I went back and told my wife, I'm like, this is a place where I want to retire. Um, I always wanted to end up in Florida mm -hmm. because my grandparents lived here. Growing up, I'd come here and visit them. Mm -hmm. um, but that's pretty much why we chose it. And my wife came down here, saw the area. She was like, yep, this is it. Yeah, it's perfect so, here. Oh. We were always, we were, we were driving around, we're like, this is a perfect, like, nice, like, quiet area. But it seems like there's a lot to do. Yeah, and it's and it, everybody knows everybody. It's a small yeah, it's town, a very small town yep. feel. Um, everybody's very neighborly here, mm -hmm. you know. And that's when we first moved here, pulling up to the house. I mean, our neighbors came out like that's cool. You help moving. It was six packs of beer, you know, just that's like cool. neighborly stuff, which you didn't get in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, we love it here. The people mm -hmm. here are awesome. So we have a book, right? Yep, the man in the arena. Man in the arena, audio, and you have the written, obviously. Yeah, right. So it's yeah. When I got out. <clears throat> Obviously, that was a whole different type of transition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, getting out of the military after 20 years is hard enough. Um, trying to transition in the civilian sector and sort of de-institutionalize yourself. Yeah. Um, but then I had this whole mess on top of that. Um, and because the country was so divided and still is, but <clears throat> I was, I got out and I was still getting smeared, um, you know, the left whatever publications the left had they were coming after me yeah um and so i decided you know i had talked to uh, bernie carrick uh, who was the police commissioner of uh new york during 9-11 mm -hmm. he was like you need to write the book right now you need to put your side of the story out um, or else it's never like no one's ever going to hear it so yeah. that was a very hard decision for me to write that book um because i was raising the seal teams like we don't write books we don't talk about what we do um None of that stuff. So that was a big moment um, when I decided to, yes, I'm going to write the book. Um, and I did it more for my family and uh, just to, like, settle this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I luckily, well, luckily or unluckily, or you want to call it the pandemic, ha happened, right? So that gave me ample amount of time to mm -hmm. sit in my house and work on the book. Um, and... I ended up getting it done within a year, mm -hmm. um, getting it out there. But the cool thing about it, and um, I decided to do this at the last, sort of when we were near the end of the book, I was sitting there reading it, what I had wrote, and I'm like, you know, this is definitely my side of the story. Yeah. And like, so people can be like, all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. But what I decided to do, I had all of the trial audio, all the NCIS interviews, all the evidence that they were throwing against me. So I put that all in the book in QR code. So as you're reading it, you can hit on that QR code and you can watch all the unedited trial audio, NCIS interviews, see all the evidence they had, and you can make up your own mind, And which mm -hmm. I think is a lost art in this country nowadays, the, the critical thinking aspect. Yeah. People just want to read the headline or the clickbait headline and they make their, well, oh, this guy's guilty or this is what happened. For sure. I was like, nope, here's all the facts, and you can make the decision for yourself, mm -hmm. um, which I think was has been huge yeah. so far for people. No, I, I mean, I definitely want to finish listening to the book. I feel like I know you more than anything right now. It's <laughs> two days of, of nonstop just getting after it with you has is, is been amazing. Oh, right? it's been and, awesome. And meeting your wife and your kids is, is awesome. So I'm glad everything's working out, honestly. We got things in the works that we want to do. Yeah. Um, you know the the combination of what me and you bring to the table is is going to be phenomenal but is there anything else that you want to push right now you know <laughs> say yeah. say the say the slogan right now the fafo the fuck around and find out <laughs> yeah. love, we love that man that's the best thing ever that's so it. where can we get those shirts and then also the book and everything else yeah so well the book you can get off of the eddie gallagher mm -hmm. or on amazon you know it's on there um so that that's still being sold. Mm -hmm. uh, the FAFO. So I'll give a quick backstory to that. Yep. Just how we came up with this. Um, you know, during the trial or during that whole mess. And like I said, my wife, she was the savior. I mean, she stood up and fought for me when I couldn't. Um, and she was destroying the Navy, um, the government, with just the cold hard truth. And mm -hmm. she kept she kept at it. And she did not let them get away with one little white lie. And uh, they were losing their minds over it. Mm -hmm. And so I think at one point they had pulled some some other BS. I, and there was so much of it, I forget which one it was. But she was like, nope. She's like, here we go again. She's like, fuck around and find out. And put out her, Perfect. you know, and I was like, that's it, that's it right there. I mean, and that's the mentality we've pretty much had the whole time. Yeah. Like, 
And I think people, you know, look at fuck around and find out like, oh, let's like it's not aggressive. It's more like, hey, I'm cool, you're cool, let's be cool. But if you don't want to, like, I'm down for whatever, whatever. We'll fight back, yeah. you know. Absolutely. Um, and that's sort of the mindset. So when we when I got out, uh, Nine Line, um, mm. which uh, Tyler Merritt owns Nine Line, they were behind us the whole time. They were raising money for us for our legal funds, yeah. um, and so they gave me the option when I got out, like, hey, we want, you want to start like a brand or do some T-shirt thing? And of course, I'm brand new to all this, man. Like yeah. I have no clue what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, okay, doing well though. Yeah, it's going good. <laughs> Um, so I was like, hey, this is the brand I want. Yeah. Um, and he was like, done. So we started making t-shirts. Uh, and I really, we had no direction. We were just like, hey, we'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been awesome to see how much it's grown. Mm -hmm. And just the, how everyone's sort of taken on that same mentality and mindset. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's been awesome. So you can get, I mean, the shirts are at Nine Line, or you can go on theeddiegallagher.com, which is my site, and mm -hmm. see all the... Uh, different apparel I have, and I also do uh, weapons or guns mm -hmm. um, here at Precision Tactical, which is a mm -hmm. local uh, gun store here. Um, we make the Seek Battle Rifle, which is, uh, you can get it in 14 and a half or 10 inch. We also do a Seek Battle Glock, mm -hmm. and then Brass Knuckles as well. The brass Knuckles are cool, I know they sell yeah. out. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you do want to see that, that gun in action, you can watch the other video of me <laughs> at the range with this man here. Uh, phenomenal gun, by the way. I was, I was, I was hitting more than on that gun than the other ones. Oh, you're killing it! Yeah. Look at this guy. See this <laughs> shit talking right there. <laughs> Check out that video, by the way, and all the other videos that we've done for these in these past two days. Um, we're gonna do more things in the future, Definitely. so stay tuned for that. And then Eddie, thanks so much for having us, and thanks for coming on the podcast, man. No, brother, I, dude, it's been awesome. You guys are. Definitely uh, my people, man. Appreciate it's been good it, man. hanging out with you guys for the past two days. Cool, man. Definitely all right. looking forward to it. Anything else you're done? No, oh, man. Instagram. Instagram, all the social media platforms. Yeah, so I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram. That's sort of mm -hmm. Eddie underscore Gallagher. Um, I'm on there. You know, you'll just. Yeah. Uh, and I also, uh, the uh, foundation. I completely skipped over. That's the most yeah. important thing. Um, through, our, through this whole process, when I came out of the trial, we started the Pipe Hitter Foundation, um, and what we do is we help active duty, law enforcement, and first responders if they're put in an unjust situation, just sort of like we were, and we step in, we um, provide emergency relief funds for their family as they're going through that stressful time, we raise money for their legal fees, and then we will also go advocate for them. Because during all that mess, my wife created the roadmap. My wife and my brother, Sean, I don't want to leave him out because he was definitely a huge part of it. They created this roadmap how to defeat the media and all their BS, and um, they got the right contacts up in Congress. Nice. Um, so we utilize all that to help others now, cool. and which is the point. Um, Perfect. That's why we started it. Love it, man. All right. That's it. That's a wrap. Hope you guys liked it. See you again next time. All right.